In this video, we'll get into how to do data modeling. In the last video, I mentioned that the purpose of normalization was to provide techniques for minimizing redundant data in databases. And the first three rules of normalization are shown here. The first rule is that every row has to have a unique identifier, the primary key and no single attribute can have multiple values. So we can't cram two employee IDs in the high school table or two phone numbers uh, into the same row of the employee table. The second rule of normalization is each attribute in a row must be related to the primary key. So basically what we want to do is, when we decide which attributes go into which entities, is to put those attributes together that are related and specifically related to the primary key. The third rule of normalization is every attribute in a row must be related to the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. The way to remember this is this is similar to the phrase you've heard many times, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And what we mean in this case is sometimes we might have more than one attribute that's needed to be the primary key. If that's the case, we want to make sure all of the other attributes in that row are related to the whole key, both of the attributes that are part of the primary key and aren't related to anything other than the primary key. If we find out that we have violated the third rule of normalization, we probably haven't structured our tables properly and we'll want to reorganize our attributes into different tables. Selecting the primary key is critically important. The primary key is the unique identifier for each row in our table. It normally never changes. So once we pick an attribute to be the primary key, it normally never gets updated. For the primary key, we could have one attribute or multiple attributes to uniquely identify each row. But if we can identify a single attribute, that's preferable. It's also preferred to have shorter values because this reduces the typing associated with the key. So for instance, if we had a choice between picking a user ID or an email address to uniquely identify someone in our database, the user ID would be preferable because it's usually shorter than the email address. If we have an attribute where the data is confidential, like social security number, that's usually not a good choice for a primary key. If it has to be kept confidential, it's better to make it a non-key attribute that we can encrypt for the sake of security. And lastly, if we have a choice between two attributes that can each uniquely identify the primary key, we'll pick one. And based upon what I said earlier, we're going to typically pick the shorter one, just to make the typing e easier and less error prone. So as we begin our data modeling, we need to assign our attributes to entities using the three rules of normalization we just discussed. Then we need to identify the entities and their relationships to each other, determine the multiplicity of the relationships, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Multiplicity means how many times one entity occurs in relationship to the other. We need to select the primary key, make sure as I mentioned, that the attributes are assigned based upon the principles of normalization. We need to understand the data types and 
then we'll look at interpreting the entity relationship diagrams. So as we're doing our diagramming, you'll recall an entity is a person, place, thing, or event, and it's drawn in a box with a unique name. The relationship is drawn as a line connecting two or more entities. Within each entity, the columns in our table are listed on individual lines within the box for our particular entity. The primary key by convention is normally listed first. Each of the attributes is going to have some sort of data type, although they're not shown in this example. We may have multiple attributes to identify each row in our data table, but in this example here, we have one attribute, department ID for department and position number for position. We're going to be using the crow's foot notation for our entity relationship modeling because this is the most popular approach. Uh, if you prefer to use the unified modeling language standard, the UML standard, you can do that. But I find when students are learning data modeling, the crow's foot notation not only is the most popular, but it's the easiest to understand. We have four different types of relationships that are shown here. We can indicate a relationship where the multiplicity, the number of occurrences, is either zero to one, one and only one, zero to many, or one to many. As we look at how two entities are related, the maximum multiplicity is sometimes called cardinality, and the minimum multiplicity is sometimes called participation. And that's always going to be 0 or 1. So either we participate, which would be a 1, or we don't participate, which would be the 0 relationship. So if we look at this first example, the relationship line describes two relationships. In order to describe this in English, we always begin with the singular case. So in this case, a position belongs to one and only one department. And we can read it in reverse by saying one department has one to many positions. So this one line represents two relationships, the relationship between department and position, and then the relationship between position and department. It's important when we're describing the relationship, as I mentioned before, to begin with the singular case. A position belongs to one and only one department. A department has one to many positions. So you'll notice that the multiplicity is near the object in the sentence. So this is the same example that we just looked at. There are two relationships here, but sometimes we summarize those two relationships in one sentence. And as a shorthand, where we have a maximum multiplicity of one on one side of the relationship line and a maximum multiplicity of many on the other side of the relationship line, we might summarize that and say these two entities together have a one-to-many relationship. Here's a second example. Once again, every relationship line describes two relationships. In this case, a staff person can have one-to-many positions and a position 
can have zero to many staff people. So a position might not be filled at a particular time, which is why there might be zero to many staff people. So a position might be, for instance, programmer, and if there are no programmers currently at the company, the staff would be zero. If there were several programmers at the company, the number could be many. In the case of a staff person can have one to many positions. Maybe the person is a programmer and also a web designer. Here's the same example again. The relationship line describes two relationships, but sometimes we summarize this and say these two entities have a many-to-many -many relationship, meaning the multiplicity on each side of the relationship is many. A staff person can have one to many positions. A position can have zero to many staff people. Let me point out once again that when we're describing this relationship, the multiplicity is near the object of the sentence, and our relationship sentences always begin with the singular case. A staff person, a position, and then we describe the relationship to the other table. So when we're doing logical data modeling, we need to identify the foreign keys, those attributes that are going to be in one entity to match back to a row in another entity. This is the one difference between logical and conceptual modeling. At the conceptual level, we usually don't go to the level of detail of identifying the foreign keys. We also need to resolve what we're going to do with multiple valued attributes. At the conceptual level, in data modeling, we might not yet know that we need multiple values for a phone number, but once we get into the logical data modeling, we would typically know that, and because we know multiple values are not going to be allowed in individual cells in our physical tables, we need to handle those multi-valued attributes before we complete our logical data model. We're also going to have a large number of one-to-many relationships. We might have some one-to-one -one relationships, many-to-many -many relationships. We might have a category of strong and weak entities, which is a flavor of one-to-many relationships. Another type of relationship that we'll take a look at are recursive relationships, and then we'll get into some of the more complex relationships, including generalization, specialization, and aggregation, and how we deal with those in our data model. But we, before we get into that, let's just review a little bit more terminology. Hopefully you remember that a view is a virtual table. Views are not going to be included in our data model. What we're going to be doing is modeling the tables, the, the entities that will ultimately become the physical tables in our data model. A candidate key is an attribute that might be chosen to be the primary key. So for instance, if we wanted to identify employee, some of the candidate attributes would be employee ID, social security number, uh, email address, all of those would uniquely identify an employee. The reason that we need to know the candidate keys are we're going to pick one of them to be the primary key, and the ones we don't pick are going to be the alternate keys. If we have no attributes that make a good primary key, we're going to make one up. And when we do that, that's called a surrogate key. As I mentioned before, a foreign key is an attribute that's used to normally match to the primary key, but it can also be used to match to a candidate key, 
that hasn't been chosen to be primary.